Greetings, legendary listeners. Welcome to The Marvelous TV Club, a podcast tackling our collective obsession with the latest releases from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And today we are all about the penultimate episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier titled Truth. Honestly, one of the best hours of anything Marvel has ever done. Thanks to a certain viral tweet this week, we've added at least a few hundred new folks to the club, so welcome aboard. Here's how this place works. Every week we analyze the latest chapter of the MCU from three unique angles on three different episodes. We begin our weekly analysis on Saturdays with this show, StoryCast. This is where we break down Marvel TV episodes not by plot, but by themes, symbols, genres, and archetypes because there is often a deeper layer that connects the various storylines in an episode. And understanding other works in film and literature that might have influenced the episode can also shed new light on it. This is one of the most unique TV analysis pods anywhere, and you can only get it here from the Marvelous TV Club. Then on Monday, Christine Kippens and I will bring you our character cast, where we will discuss the arcs and choices of the major players in the episode. Christine was the star of our viral clip, so you'll definitely want to check out this show. And on Wednesday, Jesse Taylor and I bring you Ponder Vision, the show which zooms out to ask the deepest, weirdest, and most enjoyable questions left unanswered as we look ahead to the final episode. I promise you will literally be pondering stuff you had never considered before, from a few serious ideas to some extremely funny ones. I am your host, Mark Folletti. I produce podcasts on justice issues for a living, like the show Boom Lawyered from Rewire News Group. I bought my first comic in 1981, and I've been obsessed with the MCU since its inception. WandaVision blew me away, but I found myself wanting podcasts that didn't exist, something a little more thought-provoking and well-structured than the usual plot recaps and group rambles. That's where the idea for this project came from and the three different shows. I mean, look, I love a good ramble, but I'm also hungry for something more. So thank you for listening. I promise shorter intros the rest of the week. But my last request, if you're new to the show and you wind up enjoying it, please leave us a five-star review on Apple. I did not invent the capitalist hellscape in which we live, but I do need to leverage its algorithms and it would mean a lot. So let's get to it. As I said, this is our story cast. We're going to explore the major themes driving the episode. As always, I am joined by our two story experts from the iconic website Salon.com. Writer Amanda Marcotte. How's it going, Amanda? Good. And I have a bone to pick with you from... That was fast. <laughs> so it appears listening to Ponder Vision and Character Cast, um, I couldn't help but notice that it seems to be the belief in the rest of the podcastosphere that I wouldn't take the super soldier serum. Let me <laughs> be clear. I would absolutely take the super soldier serum. I am, yeah, you would. I am not a person that's really good at like saying no to temptation. <laughs> you <laughs> probably know, Mark. Familiar with that, yeah. Um, I'm just saying I can distinguish the fact that I would immediately swallow it when, without hesitation <laughs> from the question of whether it's morally right or wrong. Just putting that out there. Well, that's, that's fair. I mean, now... The thing is, Jesse turned me around on it. So we're still utterly a house divided across the entire <laughs> Marvelous TV Club. It's a bunch of people on one side and a bunch of people on the other. So, Maeve, we know where you stand. And mm -hmm. of course, to introduce you officially, Maeve is a professor of English and the director of the Digital Arts and Humanities program at Manhattan College. She is also known as Dr. A on this show because, I don't know, I mean, she kind of wants to be a supervillain and I kind of want that for her. So, you know, <laughs> welcome, Dr. A. I really appreciate that you want things that I want. Want for me things that I want. Yeah. I'd be a bad host if I didn't, you know? Yeah, so that's correct. Feel. A bad friend also. Uh, but I have <laughs> some good news. I got an email from some former students collectively saying that uh, they wanted to let me know that they were listening to the podcast together virtually on wow. Zoom which is magnificent. They've decided, number one, that they will call me Dr. A from here on forward <laughs> to honor my evil moniker. And number two, I just want to say shout out to English 335, Victorian literature. Y'all are amazing. And thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you guys so much. And welcome to the club. Let's <laughs> dive right into some themes. We had a little bit of an intro there again. Thank you all for bearing with me and welcome to everybody new. Maeve, start us off with a theme. What was driving the story in the episode, Truth? One of the themes that I think is really dominant in this episode, that's going to sound a little counterintuitive because this is a superhero story, is the heroism of the ordinary. Hmm. Okay, so bear with me a second. 
I want to think about a couple of scenes at the end of this episode that I think are really striking in this regard, right? We're in the midst of a superhero story, right? Several very powerful people, some of them overpowered, some of them superpowered. And one of the things that takes up a bulk of this episode is a series of scenes of folks helping each other out in a kind of mundane way. Not least of all are Sam and Bucky, right? They become kind of champions of this idea that there is true heroism in folks coming together and helping each other read an engine manual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's not really like normally what you think of as riveting TV. Right? Certainly not riveting adventure drama, right? So we've got these two characters who realize that they each have needs. They need to help each other out. You know, we talked in another episode about that idea that if your neighbor comes to your door and asks for some flour, you don't be a dick and not give them flour, right? Yeah. You help each other out. And that's at the, at the core of this episode is an idea that as much as we in American culture have valorized the idea of the superheroic, extraordinary individual, there is much more genuine heroism in ordinary acts of kindness, of mundane acts of community building, right? So we've got Sam and Bucky in these scenes just helping each other. You know, Bucky shows up. There's that wonderful moment where, you know, the, the, the some kind of gasket goes or something. I don't know. I'm, I'm terrible with mechanics. But the, you know, there's steam coming out and Sarah comes out and she's like, oh my God, you know, Sam, fix it, whatever. Like, there's a problem. You're not paying attention. And, you know, Buck, you know, Sam can't do it. So Bucky comes over and with his non-dominant hand, oh, I mean, yeah. his dominant hand, his right hand, right? The one that's not supercharged, he helps Sam out in terms of like getting this like bolt tightened. And Sam says to him, you didn't use your whatever it's called, your mechanical hand. And he says, well, you know, I often don't think of using it. Because it's not, I, you know, I, I'm dominant with my right hand. <laughs> That's so true. Um, I, I picked up on this too, Maeve. I, it was one of those things where the scene where Sam picks up the phone and starts calling everyone who owed his parents a favor. I oh. was like, it's a wonderful life. <laughs> it oh really God. is just evocative of probably one of the greatest movies about the heroism of ordinary people. You yeah. know, it's a wonderful life. And like, that's how the end of the movie goes, right? Everybody in the community comes together because he's helped all these people and not in super heroic ways in these like little mundane ways. And they rally around to help him out um, and save him, you know, from ruin. Yeah. And, you know, it's and I think it's it's important that we think about that scene of the phone calls going back and forth. Because that, uh, you know, that that's the kind of scene that we see in kind of like hokey um, suburban dramas, right? <laughs> I'm trying to think of one, the, a, a good example of one. I mean, oh, It's a Wonderful Life is kind of that again. again. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I really just want Mark to do his Jimmy Stewart impression. <laughs> oh, my God. It's in Bob's house and, and Fred's house. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not um, that's my Jimmy Stewart. You're, you're, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't have your money. Anyway, it's fine. <laughs> but, you know, the, the wonderful thing about this series of phone calls back and forth is that uh, this is an extension of a long legacy of families helping each other out, right? So right before, I think it's right before that, Sarah says to her kids, like packs her kids lunches and then says to them, make sure your friends get this food because and it's it's a really profound moment of of communal understanding right mm. because she says their dad doesn't get up before 12 but it would be terribly shaming if it were essentially conceived of as charity this is not charity this is just us taking care of one another and that mundane communal sense of care mm -hmm. and reciprocity that, you know, this isn't, it's not about a debt unpaid, right? It's not about Sam being like, yo, my parents helped you out. It's time for you to pay up, right? Like, it's not that sort of like <laughs> macho masculine. It's this sort of. Don't you know who I am? I'm the Falcon, God damn it. That's a... <laughs> right, which like Sam has never sort of like dug into that idea. He's always kind of avoided that, like, you know, fame, fame equals privilege. But 
there's something really profound about this moment of reciprocity that has a, it, it, there's a long durée. There is this long legacy of reciprocity in this community. And I think it's really crucial because the episode begins with the exact opposite of that. John is a figure that believes that superheroism entitles him to become an executioner. It's disturbing at the beginning of this episode. And it only gets worse, right? John's sort of self-justifications around executing an innocent human being are all about the exceptionalism of being a superhero. Yeah, I mean, I think um, he literally thinks about Hoskins saying, you made the right decisions in the heat of battle. And like, it, it's so brutal to hear him use his friend kind of like just being a friend to him as justification for his actions, including the fact that he, his actions got that friend killed. Yeah. And it's funny too, because it, we revisit that moment where, you know, where Lamar says to him, the serum, or he says that the power is only going to make you more yourself. Mm -hmm. Christine talked about this on character cast and I, I think that in the context of the last episode, we we buy Lamar what Lamar is saying, that he's saying it's only going to make you more you and you are, it, it, for Lamar, you know, John is a good person, basically. When we re-see it in the context of this episode, though, it's very clear, and it's clear at the end of the episode, the last episode also, that becoming more of himself is not a great thing. We're not all sitting around cheering no. for that, excited about him becoming more of himself, but it also makes us revisit that idea. Does, in fact, becoming superpowered make you more yourself? Well, it might make John more himself, but it certainly doesn't make you more human. That there's something inhumane about the extraordinary, about the superheroic, that it, or rather that superheroism bends to inhumanity. Uh -huh. Which is something Zemo basically talked about. You know, that's, that's a very yeah. Zemo-like position. Hashtag Zemo was right. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> oh, no. No, but I mean, I, I think, well, like a lot of good villains, he has a truth inside of him, though, the way he wants to approach it and what he's willing to do to achieve his ends, right? That's the real problem. So in this context, Maeve, like, how do, how do the Flag Smashers and even, like, the GRC factor into all of this? So I've been talking about John and his sort of bending towards inhumanity with his superheroism. But Carly and, you know, as a representative of the flag measures in the GRC are also both representatives of the idea or the commitment to the exceptionalism of the superheroic, the exceptionalism of the extraordinary. Oh. So Carly hires an assassin to help with her mission, and she justifies it. Uh, according to the principle that these are extraordinary circumstances, hmm. which is a very conventional one. And, and, you know, I think that just like John's own self view of himself as a hero has caused all these problems. The same could be said of Carly, right? She yeah. thinks that she's protecting this community, but she drew all this negative attention on them that got them smashed to bits. And I think with the little toy bunny, that she holds mm. is a pretty profound symbol of the heroism of the ordinary that you're talking about, Maeve, in that, in that like those refugees, um, Mamadonia, her heroism was cleaning up people, f clothing people, feeding people. We, Educating people. Yeah, we saw right. this refugee camp was full of teachers and social workers and people actually doing the not glamorous work of holding each other up. And Carly, can, she thinks she's their protector, but she actually took actions that led to them being destroyed. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, and the GRC is is not immune from this problem too. And, and in some ways it's kind of obvious, it's right. It is the status of governments or rather governments claim the status of exception, the state of exception in all kinds of contexts, right? War is the most obvious example, but governments and governmental entities claim the right to use violence, to use extraordinary powers against others all the time with whatever justifications that they deem necessary. And the GRC at the end of this episode 
is making a case for doing something extraordinary and crushing the flag smashers. And there's that moment where, the, you know, some diplomat uh, who is there sort of trying to reckon with the with the with the with the extreme violence that's being proposed. She says, we're not rounding people up like cattle. But of course they are. Of course they right? are. Right. And so that's, you know, this this, uh, you know, again, the there's another figure who has decided and the figure here is a sort of a collective, a governmental collective has decided that. These extraordinary circumstances justify ex extraordinary behavior, but that is not heroic. None of this is, it all sounds, it, in the end, I mean, Carly is probably the least, in my mind, the least to blame for her own, if we're going to try to sort of create a hierarchy of moral failing here, <laughs> right? Like, the, I mean, like John and the GRC are vying for you know, the, the most sort of evil <laughs> in this episode. Right. Their hubris is rooted in privilege. Hers is rooted in injustice. And, I, and that that's beautifully said. That's exactly right. Right. When we when we when we see Carly and her decision making and her decision making gets played out for us because she's got her kind of counterpoint worked into that conversation where she's hiring the assassin. Right. She makes clear to us that this is about something bigger than herself. Whereas John is motivated by self, right? Him hollering at Sam, I am Captain America. I, I loved that moment because it's both real heavy handed. And I will say that I am like actually really glad in a totally sort of distinctive way that this show, broadly speaking, has not shied away from saying exactly what it wants to say. Yeah, I mean, there was... That was also a joke. So they managed to like work and weave some irony and some camp Wait, into what, that. What was a joke? Him, I mean, him going, "I am Captain America." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the character is not joking, but no, 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 no. <laughs> but he is a cartoon. No, it reminds me of like um, Dean's voice on Supernatural. Where it's like, "Come on, Sam!" Like he's just trying to talk like an octave lower than he normally does to sound tough. Yeah. Well, it's funny because John is a caricature of himself in the way that comic book characters often are, except that we don't hate Batman or think that Batman is silly. We don't think Superman. I mean, <laughs> you know, we might we might we might think they're a little bit silly, but we but we don't think they're silly in exactly the same way. Right. So when John says, I killed him because I had to, it's a bizarre it's stupid. It's a stupid argument. It's, it is what we call a tautology, right? <laughs> Where you say X equals Y. And just by saying X equals Y, Y becomes X. That's not true. Chickens are not oranges, <laughs> right? A chicken right. is an orange. No, uh, no, no, no. A tautological, that's a tautological fallacy. And, you know, and that's exactly what John as Captain America, as the superhero of this in his own mind, as a superhero of the, of the show in his own mind, he lives by these kind of caricature, caricatured sentiments. And I do think that there's something really profound about a superhero show that is based on a series of comic books, drawing attention to the way that we, that, that the, that this is a caricature-able idea, that superheroism is not, in fact, necessarily heroic. Well, I love the stuff that you're talking about with the focus on the little things and how that's more meaningful and where the heroism derives from. It makes me think about Sharon, who is now obsessed with the finer things, and it, it seems like it's turned her bad. Maybe we'll find out this is all some master plot of justice to like hand off a bunch of fake bombs to the flag smashers. I'm skeptical that nope. they're going to do that. <laughs> Was there anything else about Sharon's world that jumped out to you as part of this theme? I mean, first of all, I'm going to say that I'm with Christine, that Sharon is the power broker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> number one. Uh, number two, there's something, there's another little tiny piece of evidence for this idea that there is heroism in the ordinary. Repeatedly, when we see Sharon in, in many episodes that we've seen Sharon in, the Monet painting, Woman with a Parasol, appears. Now, we've talked about this before in StoryCast. We've talked about it with respect to the way that sort of great works of art are being kind of auctioned off to the highest bidder and then don't become sort of part of the, the sort of general cultural heritage. 
there's something there's something else that's worth paying attention to with respect to this particular painting because it's an example of impressionism, which was a movement, a 19th century artistic movement, very much in painting, but in other genres also or other forms. One of the key principles that is evidenced in this painting, so this is a painting by Monet. It's a painting of his wife in a field of flowers or wheats or I don't know, something, right? So yeah. this natural landscape. His wife is in, is in the world of art, a, a nobody. In the world of culture, in the world of politics, in the world of power, a nobody. This is like in contrast to like a lot of the more traditional kinds of subjects of paintings prior to the 19th yeah. century. So like gods and heroes, right? Mm, right? Well, and not just that, right? Portraiture in, you know, you know, look at Renaissance portraiture. Look at 18th century portraiture. Who gets painted in Renaissance and 18th century portraiture? Kings and queens. Correct. And noble people, right. other people who have power or money. And oftentimes what you'll see in portraiture, Flemish painting, for example, Flemish portraiture is some of my favorite portraiture because the realism is so, it, you know, it's like almost three-dimensional on the canvas. But one of the things that is crucial to that is people are always positioned with respect to things that demonstrate their wealth their, their material wealth or their spiritual wealth. So their crosses. They'll be standing in a room that shows how big their bed is. <laughs> right, exactly. That shows that they were capable of buying these commodities or it demonstrates their knowledge. They're so like, it's like a, a pile of, of special books. It's like what people do in Zoom calls now, right? There are apparently people who will design your, li your, your bookshelf for you oh my God. so that you can look real learned or something. I don't know, like which is hilarious. Casually, I'm like, oh, I just happen to have the coolest new book. Exactly. Wow, that's grim. That's America for but you. that's But that's what portraiture was before, before Impressionism. It was almost exclusively that, unless there was a kind of parody happening. But what happens in Impressionism with portraiture is we start representing ordinary subjects as worthy of artistic immortalization. Yeah, people hanging out at the park, people working especially people working and, you know, people out, you know, exactly out in a field, you know, sort of gathering wheat and the aestheticization of that, the making that beautiful is a crucial component of impressionism. I'm not saying that labor and classes weren't represented in paintings before that, or even that they weren't beautiful, but that was an outlying position for, for example, the portrait right? The portrait was always a rich person, not an ordinary person. Or if it was an ordinary person, it was this weird outlier, right? Impressionism did something to convert the way we think about what we might say is the heroism of the ordinary. Well, now you're making me think Sharon really is actually going to be a secret good guy because she's got this painting and it signifies all her wealth, but hidden in it is this message about, you know, the heroism of the ordinary. But she also had that <laughs> um, painting of that's more traditional art of like, it was a great heroic battle scene. I don't remember what scene it was, but there was like a shot where... Right. Yeah, there's a shot where we're pulling into her office. There's a painting on the hallway and that's a more traditional classic right. art, pre-modern art of of a, a battle scene, a heroic battle scene. So I, the right. contrast is... Well, then I'm back is, out. Sharon, you're a bastard. <laughs> well, the um. two paintings are held in contrast with each other pretty deliberately right. in the way that the show is shot. Well, and also her, her intentions with these works of art aren't about celebrating the ordinary. They're about celebrating the extraordinary. The value of that painting for Sharon does not come from the fact that it represents somebody ordinary in the world. It comes from the fact that we have deemed Monet to be an extraordinary painter and therefore worthy of extraordinary financial value. Wow. She's selling that painting to the highest bidder. Sharon, Sharon no, no, I, I have now decided <laughs> along with Christine... But Sharon is the power broker. No, I'm also, I'm on team Sharon is the power broker. Although the Contessa is a new interesting arrival. We'll, we'll see what their final Ooh. relationship is. But I think we're saving the best for last here. Maeve, surely the man who stole the scene he was in once again, Carl Lumbly as Isaiah Bradley. How does he fit the theme of heroism of the ordinary? Here's the problem with America, or one of the problems. My goodness, yeah, so there are one, so many just, of them. <laughs> just one? Just one, 900 million. One of the problems with America and American culture is that this idea that the extraordinary is the heroic is at the heart of the American idea. And yet there is this mass erasure that is necessary for all the ordinary people who propped up the 
life, daily life, the daily life and culture and economy of America. So when Isaiah Bradley says, they erased me, they've been doing that for 500 years. Mm. Number one, this is an excellent example of this show. You know, a critic might say this is a little on the nose, but no. It's a superhero <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah, right. What superhero show isn't on the nose about basically everything? But I do think, you know, in terms of the, there's something really crucial about the politics of this show that it's not going to mince words because we've been mincing words around the question of slavery, ar around the question of the exploitation of black and indigenous people, peoples of color to prop up American prosperity for, as Isaiah Bradley says, 500 years. Yeah. It has required the erasure of the ordinary, the ordinary acts of servitude and oppression that have, that, that have made America what it is. I'll point out that every time we see Isaiah, he's situated in the most domestic of situations, doing the most ordinary of things. And we, we spend more time with him in this episode than we did in the previous episode he was in. But what is he doing? He's gardening. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who loves to garden... <laughs> <laughs> However well I do it. Pretty well. Uh, <laughs> You've grown tomatoes, girl. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, you grow it's, shit upside down hard. in planters. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> but um, I, I, it, is, it is probably the most perfect symbol that you could put on screen of the kind of quiet heroism of everyday life. You are literally turning yeah. the ground into food. You're turning it into life. It's something that literally anybody can do. And yet it is a, a minor miracle. And I think that's why people l love it so much. Yeah. I mean, I, there's also, there's also the, the, the moment and there's a kind of, this is a kind of inversion, I think of what you're talking about, but complimentary that all Isaiah wanted was an, a, a kind of ordinary life. Yeah. Yeah. He wanted, the, you know, ex the extraordinary was foisted upon him and what he wanted was love. He wanted family. No, that's so perfect. Maeve, you were talking earlier about how Walker is kind of an inversion of this theme, right? That that he's the monstrous special person, the abuse of power. Mm. Isaiah is also an example of how being special can make you a target of power, a tool of power. And like you're saying, unable to live a normal life, because if you listen to his story, it's exactly the same as Steve's from First Avenger, right? He went off to go save his friends against orders. But instead of being hailed as a hero, walking back with his friends, he's jailed and tortured and his Peggy Carter dies. That is fucking wild. And again, it's an inversion of this idea. It's like being special can also cost you everything, especially when you didn't ask for it. You were not told. Nobody, nobody asked his permission to put that shit in his arm. It, well, they certainly didn't tell him what it was, you know? It goes back to what you and Jesse were talking about on Ponder Vision about Jesse's argument that the super soldier serum, at least in this world, invokes all these sort of responsibilities. And Isaiah is kind of the bridge to that concept, or, or not the responsibility concept, but a bridge to a similar concept, which is that for people that are have marginalized identities, whether they're people of color, whether they're women, whether they're queer, often being special makes you the nail that sticks out that attracts the hammer coming down on your head. Mm. Well, and, and, and there is a responsibility dimension to that, that when we live in communities with one another, targeting people as special is often a targeting. Yeah. Right. And there, you know, there's a, a a work that I think is often misinterpreted, a work of literature that's often misinterpreted because people don't actually know that this is the pl the text where the idea comes from, the idea that no man is an island. Right. So this is the idea of no man is an island comes from a poem by the 17th century poet John Donne. And the poem is it's a it's about the idea that if any other human suffers, we all suffer because we share in that collective humanity. And that, that merely sharing in collective humanity means that we care about the suffering of others, not in an, a kind of distant way, but in an immediate way. So if the extent, the sort of logical, reasonable extension of this argument is that we are in fact responsible for one another, 
And we are all the same in some kind of basic way. Targeting people or or highlighting them as standing out um, you know, alone as lone sort of signifiers of superheroic capacities or exceptions to the rule or occupying the state of exception doesn't just harm the individual. It harms all of us, that we are all harmed by this idea. And I think it goes back to something about the way that we experience our collective humanity. And the way that we experience that is most often really mundane. One of the things that Isaiah really drives home is that that collective humanity is denied by oppressive forces who will erase the suffering of people because the, the narrative is inconvenient, right? Mm-hmm. And I have a question for you with all this, Maeve, that you bring up in my head. Um, thinking about Isaiah's story, weirdly, the story that keeps coming to mind for me is Oscar Wilde's story mm. of a person with extraordinary skill who draw attention to himself by being so talented. And yeah. because of that attention was jailed for being gay and it, it killed him basically. And, yeah. you know, obviously Oscar Wilde did not want to die <laughs> or be <laughs> imprisoned, but he did not let himself be erased. He, his, if look at people who are listening to this, look up his gravestone is the biggest fuck you on the planet. <laughs> it's amazing. It's one of the best things I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and Sam asks Isaiah to tell his story to the public because he says, yeah. basically he's, he's making the art, he's making a kind of Oscar Wilde's argument, I'd say, which is like, I'm going to tell you my story and you will be forced to reckon with what was done to me. Right. Yeah. Um, and you will see the, the humanity that we share. And Isaiah, however, counters with, I want the safety of being erased in a lot of ways, even as he speaks out of being against being erased. Like he has obviously conflicted feelings about this. How did you feel about that kind of debate that they were having on those terms? Well, I, I want to say a couple of things just for folks who don't know Oscar Wilde, uh, 19th, late 19th century writer, the text that Amanda is referring to where Oscar Wilde tells his story is told from within prison, which is a striking similarity to what we see in Isaiah talking about speaking from a space of um, where he's been erased, right? Uh, so th basically, the British state tries to erase the power of Oscar Wilde, who is this extraordinarily influential figure in the late 19th century because he's an extraordinarily popular playwright. And you know, just as a kind of side note, people didn't write great plays in the 19th century no. until Oscar Wilde showed, showed up, basically. <laughs> like theater, except for some notable exceptions to that. But Oscar Wilde shows up in the late 19th century and he really revivifies uh, British theater. He writes a text called De Profundis from prison where he tells his story because basically what had happened is the juridical institutions of British government tried to erase the power of Oscar Wilde in changing English society. What's striking in terms of the parallels between Oscar Wilde and Isaiah Bradley is that both of them are speaking from a place of obscurity, forced obscurity. Isaiah is forced into obscurity because if he comes out, he will die. Right. So we have to sympathize with him in this context. It's not the same as Sam being able to walk back out into the world and act against a history of racism that has said that no black man can be Captain America. He can go back out in the world and do whatever he needs to do, you know, reckoning with a history of oppression and slavery and racism and all of that, that are the backbone of American society and culture and history. But he's, Sam is not in the same place as Isaiah. And he's the first to say that, obviously. Right. Yeah. No, it's true. So we've talked about It's a Wonderful Life. We've talked about Impressionism. We've talked about Oscar Wilde. Maeve, are there any other works of art, literature, film that relate to the theme of heroism of the ordinary? So one other text that I think would be fun to think about in this context is Hamlet, 
right? We often think of Hamlet as just a straight tragedy, a really sad story about a man who loses his father and then goes crazy trying to reckon with the grief. But Hamlet is also a play about an adolescent young man who believes that he's an exception. He's in a, He's in, an incel. Oh God. He's a little bit of an oh God. incel. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. He's, he's not that bad, but... Well, I mean, with... He's a little milady in that guy. With respect to Ophelia, he's an incel, right? He is, sort of sees himself as, as entitled to her affection, regardless of how badly he treats her. Hamlet, of course, is, is a slightly different situation, but not that different insofar as that he sees his grief and his justifications about the fact that his dad is dead as entitlements to be cruel. And that is not far off from John, who spends most of this episode when we see him justifying cruel, extraordinary cruel, execution style cruelty. <laughs> Oof, yeah, that's a good call. I feel like the, our text chain kind of contributed to this and... But I, and I would make my Oedipus joke, but I just can't figure out how to work it in. <laughs> <laughs> what a shame. No, I'm just kidding. Look, so if I'm following that's a good joke. Maeve. No, that's a good joke. Daddy? Uh, no, I'm totally kidding. Mommy? Um, so, oh my God. Uh, let me see if I can summarize what's happening here with heroism of the ordinary. In this episode, the best moments for people and the most development happens for our characters in the small things that they do, whether it's Sam and Bucky working together to save this boat, the townspeople coming together to help save the Wilson family, or Isaiah gardening and his whole conversation around reckoning, you know, with what happens when you are not allowed to be ordinary. Instead, yeah. we also have on the other side of this, the monstrous approach of people like John and to some extent, even Carly and the GRC who assume themselves to be extraordinary, perhaps for varying degrees of justification, but have some measure of domination as their goal. What am I missing as a takeaway from this theme? I mean, I don't I don't think you're missing m much of what we already discussed. I would just add that this is a hardcore reckoning with the um, myth of America, yeah. with the idea that, that the extraordinary is the heroic, is at the heart of the idea of what it means to be an exceptional, succeeding human being in America. And that's a really profound meditation. It goes right back to the first episode where Sam picks up the shield and says symbols are the men and women who, who imbue them with meaning. Right. Mm -hmm. And he was literally making that counter argument to the idea that Captain America is the symbol of an exceptionalism. Right. And yeah. Sam was saying he wants to see the shield as a symbol of, of all of us. Yeah. And, and, and to extend that there is no state of exception. Right. That is the fundamental bottom line of what, what John represents in this episode and in this show, that when there is a state of exception, there is injustice. Yeah, that's what really well said. This is a wonderful lens for the microscope of this episode. I want to turn it now. Amanda, we're going to look through your lens now. What theme did you see as, as driving the heart of this episode? So the theme I pulled out was the concept, I think, of self-determination. Um, it was really important to this episode and the shield, uh, which has been the symbol of literally kind of every concept that this show is wrestling with also carries this concept in it. Mm. You know, it is the shield is almost a symbol of symbolism itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in this particular case, both Sam and John are like looking at the shield as something that they can as a, a self to, in this episode, at least a symbol of self-determination and how that functions in this narrative is really interesting to me because there's a question of self-determination done the right way and self-determination done the wrong way. It's not that it's wrong to be self-determining, but I think we see this episode really grappling with what it means to define yourself, to define your future, to define your ideals, who you are, your identity, all sorts of things like that. So what does the right way to self-define look like then? What are the terms of that? 
I mean, the good news is we have a goofus and gallant situation here, right? Don't hmm. we? <laughs> we have um, Sam Sorry, Wilson. Who are goofus and gallant? Yeah, who are goofus and gallant? Honestly, um, highlights magazine. I had highlights. I had but highlights. I, feel like I, I mean, don't, okay. You know. Recall for, Goofus and Gallant for for my I I the, my similar olds don't remember this. I mean, I'm older than you, and I <laughs> I mean, I just don't. I, you know, I didn't. It apparently didn't leave much of an impression. I just remember you know doing some connect the dots and things like that. It's. I also remember mostly the connect the dots. I'm very embarrassed. For the audience, Goofus and Gallant was a cartoon in Highlights magazine every issue. <laughs> Where they would be like, Goofus does this the bad way. Gallant does this the good way. Like Goofus feeds or Gallant feeds the dog <laughs> his lunch. Goofus kicks the dog. It was, I mean, it was never oh that God. bad. It was never wow. a dog kicking bad, but it was like Goofus was always doing bad shit and Gallant was always the correct kid. Yeah. So here's some quick examples. Got just pulled off the internet. Goofus bosses his friends. Gallant asks, what do you want to do next? <laughs> Like, that's pretty incredible. <laughs> Goofus takes the last apple. Gallant shares his orange. So there you Aww. go. Goofus and Gallant. Hey. So, yeah. Community oriented. I love it. Ga- Gallant is um, is Sam Wilson. Gallant is uh, doing it the right way. Sam Wilson, he really has a very articulated, well-articulated, like, idea of what self-determination should look like. It's honest. Hmm. It's reckoning with the past. It's not hiding the past. It's not concealing the past. The fact that we're heading to the future doesn't mean that we ignore the past. And in fact, we should preserve and honor the past. We should expose the past. He believes in that. And we should grapple with it as sincerely and honestly as possible. And the right way means doing the work. It means Mm -hmm. no shortcuts. It's, 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 really making sure that you do not skip a step and that's how you earn the right to determine who you are in your, your future. And the reason I think that this is the, the correct reading of this, this theme is that Sam, I think has this very strong notion that if you skip a step, if you miss a step, then that's, what's going to come back always to haunt you. Right. You haven't dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's. And I think he's right in that. And, you know, I I have already self-described as an old, and I think in my own life, I can point to a lot of examples where, uh, being a hack will often catch up with you. Hmm. You know, what we've also just revealed though, is that we're on the wrong, you and me, you and me, Amanda, we're on the wrong side of the self-determination dyad here because we said we were going to take the serum and... Oh, yeah. I, I fully admit I'm a weak person. I am not Gallant. <laughs> I am goofus every you know, day, we'll, every night. goofus in all of us. <laughs> that's, well, that's not true. I, as, as one of Amanda's dearest friends, she doesn't choose the wrong cruel path. <laughs> not cruel. I wouldn't be cruel, but you know... I think that the whole point of the serum debate is recognizing that oh, a lot of us are weak. Yeah, no, I'm, I, that's <laughs> true, totally right. True. I like what you're saying about how it's important to reckon with the past, right? But it's also important not to let it define you, right? I feel like Sam goes out of his way to talk about that whether with Bucky, especially when they're having their outdoor chat. He talks to two different people, and I think those conversations go two very different ways because this is a complicated issue. So with Bucky, he gives him like a, a like a pep talk about not letting him be defined by being the winter soldier, not letting them tell you who you are, not right. letting the past define you. But he also says to Bucky that you can't just walk away from it, that you he his problem with Bucky's strategy was not that Bucky was dwelling on the past overly much. It was that he was doing it in the wrong way, which is to say like he was trying to make it about being an Avenger instead of an amender. (laughs) Right. right. That's, and that's a really nice way of putting it. Cause that's exactly what happens with Z like Zemo's moment of, of elucidation in this episode is where he helps us begin to see that this, this book of names isn't getting Bucky anywhere. Bucky knows it too, because he doesn't execute Zemo in that moment. But but Zemo's like, I crossed my name off in your book, right? This book that is fundamentally just about Bucky, like dwelling in the past, punishing himself, 
you know, it's like the hair shirt of, you know, of Bucky's life. If, if folks don't know what a hair shirt is, it's a shirt made of horse hair that people wore to basically self punish in medieval times. Um, so Amanda, you mentioned two conversations Sam had. What was the other one? The more difficult one is obviously with Isaiah, which he fully admits to Sarah afterwards. He came away from it being a little rattled about his, his view that you can just, you can, that the kind of advice he was giving to Bucky was never going to work with Isaiah. If nothing else, Isaiah is old and set in his ways, but also has lost so much, has so little really to look forward to. So Sam fully says, I I don't blame him. And if I was in his shoes, I could see myself being the same way. But he still makes the same arguments to Isaiah, calls him bitter. And he walks away from that conversation and tells Sarah that despite understanding fully how much Isaiah had his life just stripped from him and his ability to self-determine taken from him, He's still going to be Sam Wilson, which is somebody who is determined to fight for himself, fight to define his future, fight to define that shield. And the reason is, and I really related strongly to this as much as I may call myself goofus, and this is my gallant side. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I, I really related strongly to Sam's argument, which is functionally the what other choice do I have argument. He literally says, what would be the point of all the pain and sacrifice? Right. You can argue that he's naive. Hmm. Or you could say that if it wasn't for people that said that to themselves, even in the face of just terribly overwhelming obstacles, we would never have progress because at a certain point, either you, it may, it may be wishing on a well to say, I think I can still fight for this. I think I can try to force the issue. I think I can, I think Captain America can be a black man. I think women can get the right to vote. I think we can abolish slavery. I think that we can get the civil rights act passed. I think that this is possible. Many peoples have have said these things to themselves. And I think most of them probably had a dark night of the soul in this way. And what got them through it was realizing sometimes your only other choice besides hope is nihilism. Right. Or maybe not. I I mean, I'm I'm just going to push back a little on the nihilist argument. I mean, it's not, I'm not sure it's about nihilism, but about uh, maybe what the what seems to be the pointlessness of hope in a moment, right? Where your hope for a, a radiant future seems ridiculous, but you can't abandon the principles that you believe are true and good. And Sam is a is a character who embodies that all the way through this episode up until the very end where he is really it, performing the idea that against the odds, I'm going to do this thing and stand up for what I believe is fundamentally right. And that's an inclusive vision of democracy. Right. Yeah. And I really think the show did a good job of portraying Yeah, I don't want to call it the nihilistic point of view because that seems, that's a loaded word, but yeah. The hopelessness, right? The hopelessness. hopelessness. Isaiah fully admits that he's an erased person in a lot of ways. And he's not wrong, right? Yeah, Based on his experience, even Sam says as much. I feel exactly the same way. Yeah, and we we are to sympathize with that point of view. It's not... It's in a lot of ways that kind of depressed thinking is more realistic. Right. Um, but sometimes a little bull... Or it's pragmatic, maybe. Yeah. Sometimes a little bullshit can get you pretty far. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And a little bit of lying to yourself in a, for good reason that this thing that seems impossible, you know what? It's totally possible. I mean, you, you, know, you mentioned suffrage. I mean... The odds were against women, despite the fact that they represented more than 50% and still do of the population. And of course, that's exactly why men didn't want them voting. (laughs) And they knew it. And they were like, look, all we have to do is do something 
to convince enough people that enough this men. is the humane way, enough men, right? Enough men to that this is the humane way. Do you have to believe in the extraordinary in that moment? You know, a little bit counter to our point earlier, but you, know, you have to believe. You have to believe that that the principle carries through. So if Sam gives Bucky a lecture about, you know, maybe not being defined by the past totally and, you know, certainly not being defined by Steve, he says that too, you know, or being caught up in, in these, you know, aspects of other people's definition of himself. Maeve, was there anything else about Bucky that fits Amanda's theme of self-determination? Yeah, I mean, one of the moments that stands out for me in this entire episode and the show draws attention to it by slow motioning the action mm. is the moment where Bucky chooses not to execute Zemo. Right, right. Because Zemo had told everyone all along that the, these super soldiers can only be one way. They can only do one thing. And it, so I guess he's, you're saying he's proving Zemo wrong. Well, and he's he's also saying that no one individual gets to decide whether or not other people get to self-determine, hmm. right? I, I, You know, Bucky doesn't get to make that moral determination. He doesn't get to be, and maybe it's because John has just demonstrated what this looks like. He doesn't get to be judge, jury, and executioner. And also in that moment, Zemo tells him, you were programmed to be a killer. Yeah. And Bucky pointedly chooses against that programming right, right then and there. So it works on a yeah. number of levels. Well, they recognize one another's humanity in that moment. And of course, the Wakandans in this context have a more just form of punishment, that there are just desserts, right? People get punished for, for behavior that fundamentally violates the norms of community and threatens community. So Zemo needs to go and pay his due, but he's not going to be summarily executed by an individual who is like, you don't get to keep self-determining. Yeah, of course, Zemo is not going to get to self-determine on the raft, but that's a different, that's, that is the punishment for his crime. Yeah. Okay. Well, Amanda, do you have anything else that can take us even deeper into this theme of self-determination? The boat symbolism, I think, is really important to hmm. kind of establishing Sam's point of view here. Uh, the boat is something they've been struggling with from the very beginning of the season. It is a symbol of the past and like him and his sister not knowing how to handle this extremely burdensome past that they just feel weighted down by like it's an albatross. And in this episode, the solution was literally to fix the boat. <laughs> I, I, It's almost too too simple, but it's kind of got that modernist fiction simplicity to it, right? Yeah. They, they paint the boat, they clean up the boat, they fix all things that are broken on it. And the, the point of this exercise is we don't have to abandon our past to move into our future. We can just take what we have of the past and fix it up in our image and go into the future. And we can, tr and we don't know if this boat is going to work out for their family or not, but they put faith in that idea because what other choice do they have? It's funny that you <laughs> mentioned the boat because you just reminded me that there is a very crucial metaphor in ancient philosophy, namely the ship of state, right? So Plato introduces this in the Republic that we can think about the governance of a of, of a society as a ship, which is a super helpful metaphor because anytime you start thinking about community as narrow and uh, narrowly conceived as small, it's hard to imagine being instrumental about the lives of people, you know, in that it, it's much easier to be instrumental about lives when you're in a giant society. Right. So it helps to kind of narrow the compass of this. So there's something kind of extraordinary about this moment at the end of this episode where the ship, the boat ship, right, boat becomes a metaphor for how we work together towards a more, according to Plato, Republican ideal that we, we understand everybody has a role to play. We respect those roles. We honor them. And of course, Plato's society is a fundamentally unequal one. Women and slaves are necessary to the functioning of society so that men can govern. But, <laughs> Yikes. 
but the extension of that is that the boat is not a bad metaphor for good governance, for recognizing that everyone has a role to play and everyone has an important, crucial role that should be recognized. There's no erasing of individuals in that community, not, not simply because it's a small community, but also because the idea of a ship is that if the person who's not sitting up on the crow's nest decide, you know, if he decides, you know, I'm going to drink rum all day, then the ship fails. And it's also a, um, it's also a thing that's a solid object, but it moves forward in time and space. So yeah, <laughs> um, so a lot of existentialism in that. <laughs> oh my god! So look, Amanda, if there's a right way to do self determination, then by extension, there must also be a wrong way. What does that look like? I mean, obviously, that's the poser, that's the imposter, <laughs> okay. that's the person <laughs> who takes shortcuts, the person who's mistakes playing a part for self-determination and that is John Walker. <laughs> yeah. Like John Walker has a, has convinced himself that the way to be who he thinks he is is to literally just take somebody else's identity. Not do what Sam is doing. Sam Sam is taking the concept of Captain America and remaking it into his own. Right. And Steve is dead. This is something he's finally come to terms with or gone. We keep hearing he's gone. What does that mean? <laughs> um, but he's Steve on the is, moon. Is, anyway, <laughs> Steve is gone. And, and, and the question isn't like, who's the next Captain America? It's like, what can Captain America now evolve into for Sam? But John, however, is a classic imposter, somebody who wants to just, take all the the trappings of the identity that they want, but they don't give a crap about the substance of it. And in fact, mm. because they care so little for the substance of this role that they wish to embody, they, they corrupt it. And there's a lot of, a lot of concepts in our society around this. Like I said, imposters, posers, things like that. Stolen valor is the the military's version of this. That's a very common concept mm -hmm. in the military of somebody who wears someone else's medals, somebody else who steals somebody else's accolades for their service. And, and I, I really like this symbol at the end of him taking his own medals of honor and melting them into this fake shield because mm. that that was a perfect symbol of John Walker taking the thing that was very true about himself, his own earned valor, you know, however he may feel about it or whatever terrible things were done in the process of getting it. They, those were his medals. He's destroying them in order to pretend to be Captain America. And that is just a very, very classic version of this kind of narrative. It's, it's striking too, because those medals of honor were given for protecting his fellow soldiers. Yes. That he's, and this is what Lamar sort of says to him, you made good choices in those moments because you chose to help out this community of people. And of course, the violation of that is John choosing to make his own shield as if this gives him all the power and all the privilege because he's due, it's somehow due to him which is fundamentally counter to the story that this entire show is telling about how working with, with, with and in communities for those communities is the right way. And the other part of John Walker's story that feels like it's on the wrong side of this is when you compare it to what I think Bucky has just decided to do, which is go tell Yori the truth, right? He's going to go tell Yori mm. that I killed your son to give Yori the closure that Sam talked to him about providing for people, whereas Walker lies to Lamar's family and instead leaves them in a you know totally different place. It's just, it's unearned sympathy from that family. It's a, such a contrast with Sam's point of view. Sam wants the truth always to be told, right? Even he, he accedes to Isaiah's request that he not tell his story, but Sam's instinct is get that shit out there. Yeah. And John, yeah, 
part of his imposter problem, part of his poser problem is that he goes and he lies to these people. And I have to assume that that family is his second family because all we've ever heard about him and Lamar is that they've been bros since they were like little kids. Right. Wait, I have a question though in that context because this I could not read in that moment. So, you know, Lamar's mom accedes to the idea that vengeance is justice. Lamar's father essentially concedes to that, but Lamar's sister. I. Mm. What is what was your Amanda? I want to know what was your interpretation there. Like, what was that? Again, I think this is his second family, and she knows him, yeah. and she knows he's lying. Yes, like I, the parents. I, my read on it was that the parents cannot accept that this young man that they've known their whole they've known his whole life, not their whole life, but his whole life. Would yeah. lie to their faces about something so important, and I well, and they also need to know that that's just, they 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 need this in some ways more than John does. They need to know that some kind of justice has 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 been the result of the loss of their child, because there is literally no greater loss than the loss of a child. Yeah, and I think. Um, I, The sister, this is a dynamic I think a lot of us are familiar with, with close family friends is like, or family members is the older people often look at younger people with stars in their eyes, but your peers (laughs) see you for who you are. (laughs) (laughs) Indeed. They know what's right. They know what's true. Well, look, I'm still wrestling with how to fit Isaiah's story fully into this, Amanda, the right way, wrong way, the self-determination theme. What what's what's that about? I mean, Isaiah is there to problematize the the goofus and gallant narrative. Oh, interesting. How so? So we have a kind of classic story of the imposter with John Walker. And then we have the classic story of the hero. And and Sam Wilson is We've we've made fun of the hero's journey on this podcast quite a bit in the past, but <laughs> Sam Wilson is actually a reminder of why this story has so much power because there's a lot of beats in it that we recognize from Luke Skywalker and and Steve Rogers and Harry Potter and all these other kinds of stories. Yeah. Where the, the he- underdog. Yeah. Where the hero walks through the paces, goes into the wilderness, finds himself, tells the truth, and now is power en- powerful enough to beat the bad guys and to, to speak truth to power. And Sam is kind of walking that road. And Isaiah is there to remind us that to a certain extent, n- that narrative is not available to everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, yeah. again, I cannot reiterate enough that Sam himself says, if I had been in his shoes, I would have seen things the same way. So while Sam disagrees with him, about what the future looks like and what is possible. He also understands why Isaiah would see it very differently. And that's extremely powerful and gets to something I have repeatedly talked about on this podcast, which is the importance of of fiction to get us away from black and white narratives of the sort that are really popular on, say, Twitter. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Death of mankind. Yeah. Death of mankind. Well, but like this notion that there's always one right and one wrong way to see something. Like we can, yeah, we can understand through fiction that two contradictory ideas can be true at the same time for different people in different circumstances. So it can both be true that Sam is right, that we need to step forward into the future with all our might, as hard as it may be. And it can also be true that Isaiah is right, that maybe it's better to just lean into the void a little. So are there any other famous stories or things we might have heard of that deal with this kind of theme and this self-determination and the right and wrong way to go about it? Well, watching John Walker's uh, journey, as it were, in this uh, episode. Is that in <laughs> the journey. <laughs> journey. <laughs> um, obviously, John Walker is a great Gatsby character, right? He's a Jay Gatsby oh. character. How so? <laughs> Jay Gatsby is the original 
the OG of imposter, <laughs> American imposters, but like very specifically the idea that being an imposter is a Captain America kind of ideal that is a <laughs> truly American story, right? The like, I can become somebody that I'm not by simply embracing the trappings of that person. I can completely redefine myself as that person. And it's tragic in The Great Gatsby. It's a story, however, that I think has haunted uh, American uh, narrative fiction for a long time. Uh, it's really been very popular on TV in recent years. Mad Men is a great Gatsby story. Don Draper, someone who mm. stole someone else's valor and lived his life. He sure did. Uh, Walter White, somebody who just redefined himself as a drug dealer. <laughs> And and leaned pretty hard into his new identity that he just stole, um, often by killing the people that pre <laughs> that had it before. <laughs> um, and and in every case, I think we know how this story ends, which is we don't know f for a fact how it ends with Don Draper, but we we know how it ends for Walter White. We know how it ends for Jay Gatsby. And I, I think we might have a very good idea how this ends for John Walker. Well, t talk to us about that ending then. Like, uh, you know, spoiler alert if you haven't read The Great Gatsby yet, although maybe this will help you with a book report. I don't know. A uh, death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, what's funny is that there's actually an inverted version of that story, The Gatsby story. And this elucidates some of the things that we've been talking about in terms of who gets cut out of the story of self-determination, who doesn't get to take advantage of that. So there's a novelist, Patricia Highsmith, who some of us know because we've seen the film, The Talented Mr. Ripley, which is essentially, a, it's a way, in a way, it's a retelling of the Gatsby story, right? So Ripley is this working class kid who uh, sort of finagles a position for himself among the elite, and then basically turns his life into a replica of the, the elite and just swindles his way through the world. And the novels, the novels that proceed from The Talented Mr. Ripley are some of the most enjoyable novels I've ever read in my life. But they're stories of imposters, uh, of, of an imposter, namely Ripley, who essentially fundamentally undoes the idea that wealth makes privilege. That, that wealth makes right, which is a particularly American perversion of the concept of might makes right, that exposes who gets cut out from that story. And, you know, if, if we're thinking about kind of what's wrong in the self-determination story, one piece of this has to do with stuff we've already been talking about, which is that there are a whole cast of characters, including Isaiah, who don't have access to self-determination. They don't have access to that American dream of the pursuit of happiness written into the founding documents of our country. And, and, you know, I was being a little bit glib, kind of running through the references, but kind of digging a little bit more into Gatsby. I, 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 make, it, I make it sound like just an imposter story, but I think there's something very deep in that narrative, which uh, is is it's not just that he's an imposter, it's that he wants the wrong things. Right. Yeah. Like Jake Gatsby falls in love with this lifestyle and this woman, and he thinks that she's the best thing in the world where she is in a complete numbskull. <laughs> yeah, Daisy. Yeah. <laughs> and he... <laughs> Daisy of the blue eyes. <laughs> he wants the wrong things. And, and I think that he... He sees all this wealth and, and fashion and, and all these other things. And he believes that is the good life. That is the right world. And it's empty bullshit. It's not an inversion of that story, but it's, it's a compliment to that story that's told in Ripley. It's not Gatsby's fault exactly <laughs> that this has been, this is the bill of goods that's been sold to him. Who doesn't want gold lame? Okay. Right. Who doesn't want champagne every night? I mean, I don't know. It would be hard to work the next day if I drank champagne every day, but it sounds not horrible. <laughs> and I think, you know, when we think about the character of John Walker as Jake Gatsby, then I, I hope as much as he's turning into a villain we should continue to have that kind of sympathy for that same 
that same situation, which is he's been sold a bill of goods as well. His idea of what Captain America was, was about as hollow as what Jay Gatsby's vision of the American dream is, right? He saw it as this kind of about power, about prestige, about the the kind of trappings of heroism without ever really grappling with what being a hero actually means. Yeah, and for for him, that's this whole episode. I mean, what's what struck me about the beginning of this episode is that I immediately thought of the genre of the apologia, which is the explanation of why things have happened. John's whole narrative trajectory in this particular episode is the trajectory of the apologia. Him just trying to explain why he did the things he did because he sees reason in them against the unreason of the mandate, right? The American government contradicts itself in the, it, itself in the trial of John. They say the mandate is that this is going to happen to you. And he says, I've b- literally obeyed everything you've asked for. And they said that was the mandate. And it's like, Oh dear. Yeah, great point. <laughs> well, we have a problem here. He says, you built me. Yeah. And yeah, like you said about, you know, Mr. Ripley or Jay Gatsby, at a certain point, they become sympathetic figures, even though Mr. Ripley's literally a sociopath. <laughs> um, they become sympathetic figures, though, because their desires have been functionally programmed into them. And so everything they do flows from something that a misunderstanding in a sense that wasn't even necessarily their fault. And I think that whatever happens next with John Walker, however much we may hate him, I do hope that there is a little bit of sympathy left for the fact that he, the pathos of him saying, you built me. He's not wrong. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. Maeve, you mentioned something that critics might take issue with. I also have one of those. My prediction is if there's going to be a complaint about this episode, it's that it's too pat that Bucky is suddenly healed and saying all the right things, both about himself and to Sam about the experience of being a black Captain America, that Sarah is suddenly totally understanding and and the family's all coming together. And Sam, I didn't mean any of that. Meanwhile, the bad guys go full bad. Carly's a lost cause. And, you know, Walker just goes ape shit. Is this episode too pat, Amanda? I'd say no, and the reason is that they continue to circle around the Isaiah Bradley problem. Ah, right. Yes. Which is, I think Sam's story that he tells about himself that I just, yes, um, there's like the shield is loaded. All this history is very bad and complicated and particularly flat for black Americans. It's a, it's not easy to pick up the shield. Um, It's not as easy as having Bucky hand it to you and say, I'm sorry. (laughs) All these things would be true, except that we have Isaiah there as a constant reminder that it's perfectly legitimate to feel the other way about this story. Mm -hmm. And that the reason Sam is making these choices is not because it's true in some objective sense, but because it's what he as a human being needs to believe to move forward and to, and he has faith whether he's right or wrong, that by moving forward, he can make the change that he wants to see in the world. But I don't think it's as simple as saying, just do the thing. And it's, it's that justice is that easy. So let me see if I get this theme correctly. The theme of self-determination There's a right way and a wrong way to go about this. The right way is to be honest, to reckon with the past without letting it overwhelm you. And as Sam says, to do the damn work. Sam is obviously the person who's doing that, both literally working out, but also not giving into, you know, the shortcuts like John Walker took last episode with the serum. Meanwhile, Sam's also talking to Bucky about not getting overwhelmed by the past, by doing the work, by being uh, the person that you decide to be. And Bucky then shows that by proving to Zemo that he's not the person Zemo defined him to be. And also then they get together and they build a goddamn boat because that's basically a metaphor for the whole damn thing. Along with the community, right, that joins in and and says like, you know, uh, you know, we all help each other and ourselves. But then there's also this wrong way Mm -hmm. of going about it, right, where you're lying, you're covering up, you're taking shortcuts 
And like you guys talked about, you're stealing other people's valor, which is such a, a cool and terrible concept, yeah. right? Not admitting the truth to yourself is also, I think, part of that. John Walker is obviously that guy. And while I think you're right that we need to be able to see the sympathetic lens, it's also incredibly monstrous, obviously, the way that he's, you know, exploiting the legacy of Captain America and, you know, the way he then can turn around and, and be sort of insincere to Lamar's family. However, Isaiah's story is the piece that adds complexity to this, right? It's the part where basically you totally understand why Isaiah is in the position that he's in and does not feel that he has the autonomy that these other characters have. And that's what complicates this narrative, that there is, for some people, for a great many people in America especially, uh, not this opportunity because of racism uh, and also other structural inequalities. Is that is that a fair assessment? I think that is fair. Well, I will leave folks with my parting thought on this, which is I also saw this episode as a bit of a distorted vision versus clear vision of the title of the episode, and that is truth. John cannot see himself clearly. He cannot see the truth clearly. I think he is lying to himself even about who killed Lamar. However, to Maeve's point, Lamar's sister definitely sees him clearly. Isaiah can see the truth clearly, but he has been so hurt by the past that he cannot see the future clearly. And what's wild is Carly is exactly the same way. She is also so traumatized by past events that there is no future path forward. But we, the audience, can see a future forward through Sam's nephews playing with that shield. That is our window into the fact that there is a future to fight for and to try and define. Bucky finally sees himself clearly, despite, you know, Zemo's best efforts to bury him in his Winter Soldier personality. He also sees Sam's journey and struggle much more clearly. And, you know, I gotta say, he sees Sarah more clearly, too. Um, <laughs> I'm officially shipping the Bucky and Sarah train. Um, Sarah, of course, sees the plight of other neighborhood kids, right? We see little details like that in this story. And the community sees the Wilson family's goodness. And of course... Last but not least, Sam finally sees the shield clearly, the whole truth of it, the blood on it and the the sort of shining potential of it. And so that's kind of something I took away from this episode. So America is unfinished. It's unfinished yeah. and it's messy as hell. Uh, and my my final truth. Sorry, <laughs> Sam. The Sarah Bucky thing totally happening. Oh, yeah, it's going to be good. It's good shit. Oh, it's definitely happening. Definitely happening. happening. And I can't he's, wait for he's it He's going to happen. be your friend. He's going to be your partner. And he's going to be your brother-in-law. Brother -in yeah, he really took to that boat. I have a feeling he might be spending a lot more time on it. Think of how far you could cast a fishing line with a metal arm. Just going to put that out there. So anyway, look, Amanda, thank you so much for all this great insight. Where can people find and follow you? I'm at salon.com and you can find me on Twitter at my name, Amanda Marcotte. Maeve, thank you so much. Where can people find and follow you? People can find me with my 250 other followers on Twitter. Um, I'm also on academia.edu. You can read everything I have written and feel free to send me questions, emails, whatever. You can find my email online. I'm at, I'm at Manhattan College. I'm making a huge request of all of our new listeners to go ahead and follow Maeve. She's, we're getting her a public Twitter presence and we're making it happen. So Maeve Adams, M-A-E-V-E-A-D-A-M-S. Follow her. I am Mark Fletty. Of course, you can also follow me at M-A-R-C-F like Frank, A-L-E-T-T-I. And Audio Avengers, that is our show for today. We have so much to talk about on CharacterCast and PonderVision, so please stay tuned for those. Like I said, I'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts so we can get into some of those rankings, get seen, get noticed. And, you know, failing that, we'd also just love it if you told a friend about our show. If you like this, anything you can do to help us spread the word would mean the world to us. So thank you so much. Let some other folks know. All right, gang, let's go throw some shields into some trees. <laughs> Fun.